All right, hey, I'm Dan Haggerty. Welcome to the story, I'm back. Did you miss me? Don't answer that. Thank you to Maggie for crushing it, as always, while I was gone. It took a long weekend. I crashed my son's big wheel. I actually hurt myself. I mean, I can barely, like, it's crazy. And I confirmed that I'm not cool, something that you guys already know. Uh, let's talk tonight. Continue to email us at thestory at kgw.com. And as always, use Twitter and that hashtag, hey Dan. We read some of the comments at the end of the show. And I, I kind of want to know what your opinion is on this, because the story of what's happening in downtown Portland is being told two different ways, I think. And at some point, it comes down to who do you believe? Do you believe the federal government or the protesters and their allies? See, today, Acting Secretary of Homeland Security Chad Wolf gave a briefing, along with the leaders of the Federal Protective Service and Customs and Border Patrol. No surprise, they characterized the protests in Portland as chaotic, with protesters being the ones driving the violence. Now, as you know, Secretary Wolf did not meet with the local media when he visited Portland last week, so we've had to rely on national media to ask him questions like today. And one of the first questions was about this video. You know this video. We've showed it to you a lot. We showed it a ton last week. It shows federal officers officers with Customs and Border Patrol walking up to the guy dressed in black and they put him in that unmarked SUV. That video changed the way people viewed the federal involvement in Portland and today Secretary Wolf defended it. Here's how. This is a very difficult environment to work in when you have 500, 600 violent individuals, violent criminals across the street from you trying to inflict harm on your property and at law enforcement officers. We do our best to identify who they are using that probable cause. What we don't do is we don't go into that crowd. We don't try to go into a violent crowd of 400 people and try to arrest people. That's, that's dangerous for our law enforcement officers. It's dangerous for those individuals as well. So we try to identify individuals uh, as best we can, again, working with the entire federal uh, presence there in Portland and address it that way. But so they're not denying what you saw in the video. They didn't deny leaving federal property to make an arrest, but they said they still had every right to do that because they witnessed someone commit a crime on federal property, and that was the probable cause they needed to make an arrest. But Oregon State Representative Janelle Bynum, frankly, uh, doesn't believe them. And she says, if you do, you're ignoring the obvious. I would say some people just don't believe fat is greasy. I mean, that's <laughs> that is such a crock. Um, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, those statements are intended to make you believe that you're crazy and that you're not seeing what you're seeing. Everyone knows what their intent is. Their intent is to stir distrust, to stir fear, um, to have a, a strong man showing um, about how much muscle they can uh, employ in a particular city. This is uh, nothing more than uh, gaslighting and uh, an attempt to intimidate. Other than a gut feeling on that, what have you seen that would provide proof to that, to that, that stance? I don't quite understand your question. What have you seen that would make you believe that all of the things that law enforcement were saying were embellishments or lies about them, them not canvassing the community, um, that they weren't rounding up people, that they were targeting people who they had suspected with probable cause as being violent individuals who had targeted federal officers or property? I think um, this is why it's so important for people to know American history and particularly for African Americans. I, I didn't grow up in Oregon, and so I was the beneficiary of a lot of um, teaching of black history from uh, the beginning of, of slavery, the beginning of this country, um, to what we see today. And, and there are parallels. Um, whenever you can put fear in people's hearts and minds, it makes them uh, forever your subject. So we've got Secretary Wolf saying officers had probable cause, and then you have Representative Bynum calling uh, BS, for lack of a better term. This is the part where it usually comes down to who do you believe? I mean, get emails every night about who you believe, though I would much rather rely on facts. So we tried to find out if the probable cause, what it was in that arrest that we saw in the video. See, last week, Border Patrol claimed they had, quote, information indicating the person in the video was suspected of assaults against federal agents or destruction of federal property. But here's the thing. So we ran a search for an arrest record from that night and we couldn't find anything. We're still looking, of course, just because we haven't found it doesn't mean there's nothing there. But for now, 
we're kind of back where we started. So do you believe the feds, what they say, and they had probable cause, or do you believe the folks who say that they're lying? Because at this point right now, we really don't have any hard evidence that either are true yet. But it is certainly a discussion that emphasizes the importance of transparency in regards to public trust and civil discourse. And that leads us into tonight's big story, where that question may be decided by a judge. See, tomorrow, a federal court will hear arguments from Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum. She filed a lawsuit last week accusing the feds of using illegal tactics. But Kyle Eboshi reports that's only one of the lawsuits federal agencies are facing after taking action in Portland. For weeks, protesters have clashed with federal officers outside the U.S. courthouse in downtown Portland. Now that struggle moves from outside on the street inside to the courtroom. On Wednesday, a judge will hear from lawyers representing Oregon's attorney general who sued federal officers for using unlawful tactics. Because it's outrageous, it's a violation of the Constitution, and we're not standing for it. Oregon's AG is seeking a temporary restraining order to restrict federal law enforcement in Portland after allegations federal officers in unmarked vans were arresting protesters without probable cause. The feds say they acted appropriately. Well, I think it's restricting, you know, my freedoms. In court filings, several Oregonians, including Jennifer Arnold, said fear of federal officers prevented her from exercising her rights to participate in peaceful protests. It seems like a very controlling maneuver to silence people, to restrict their movement, their freedom, and then, you know, to prevent them from speaking out. Similar lawsuits have also been filed on behalf of state lawmakers, a Portland church, the Western State Center, and the ACLU. They have slightly different theories and legal approaches, but all touch on the same issue. The role of federal law enforcement sent to Portland to protect federal buildings through an executive order signed by President Trump earlier this month. About, uh, Jeff Dobbins, uh, law professor at Willamette University College of Law, predicts decisions could come quickly on whether to grant temporary restraining orders. The judges are used to getting these kinds of emergency requests, and certainly in a situation like this where there's a lot of uh, pressure from the community and, uh, and obviously the stakes are very high, it, it's not unusual for judges to, to have a hearing and to be able to resolve something like this uh, on the order of just a few days. Legal experts say the way cases are resolved here in Oregon could serve as a bellwether to the rest of the country if federal law enforcement is deployed to other unwelcoming cities, as the president has suggested. Kyle Boshi, KGW News. So we've heard a lot of politicians give their opinions about the feds being here and the tactics that they're using, but what about the Portland Police Bureau? What's the relationship like there? Well, we've heard them say that they communicate with the feds, but deny coordinating with them. However, the Oregonian says that they have evidence that shows that they've been working together here. Portland Police Chief, uh, Deputy Police Chief, rather, Chris Davis, really tried to distance the Bureau from the feds while testifying before lawmakers last week. We don't have authority over them. We're, they're not under our control. Um, and so my preference would be to not have them outside their buildings unless it's a life safety right now kind of an issue. And I would prefer to police the outsides of their buildings and all of the others downtown with local and state resources where we have a a problem right now is that our resources are stretched so thin that if the federal authorities believe that they have a certain threat to their facilities, you know, they're, when they get to the point where they decide they're going to take action, there's not, I don't have the legal authority to prevent them from taking action. I would just like to make it unnecessary by having enough resources down there for us to just deal with everything outside the buildings by our, our standards. Okay, so let's talk about PPB's own tactics now. Tear gas, for instance, or CS gas as they call it, is obviously a really big one. You remember a judge banned Portland police from using it unless there's a risk to life or safety. And Portland police have used it off and on, citing safety threats. Here's what Deputy Chief Davis told lawmakers when asked about gassing protesters. CS gas is really intended to be an area denial measure. It doesn't look good. And it is, uh, you know, it covers a large area, and we expose all of our crowd control team members to it, including I myself have been through that, so they understand what it is that they're doing. Um, but if you want to stop feeling the effects of it pretty quickly, all you have to do is walk out of the area. And so, you know, we try very hard to issue as many warnings as we can, 
uh, and to stand there and have things thrown at the police for as long as we can. But if you just stand there and do not address somehow the issue of people throwing things at you, we know, based on crowd science, that it is very likely that crowd will continue to escalate in terms of its violence. Now, we should point out Portland police say that they have not used tear gas at all in the past week. If you've seen it on the news and in videos online, the feds have used it, but they don't have to follow the same judge's order on tear gas because that only applies to Portland police. I know that a lot of you have opinions about this stuff. We get emails every single night at the story at KGW.com and on Twitter, people using the hashtag HeyDan. Uh, and lots of your opinions are about our elected leaders and the things they're saying, which is why we spend so much time here on the story talking about politics and candidates and the fact that we are in a huge election year. So what should we talk about tonight? You want to talk about the presidential race? Congress maybe? How about the Portland mayor race? That's coming up pretty soon. No, how about a campaign to move Oregon's border and create greater Idaho? Yeah, this made some headlines earlier this year. A group wanted to shift around the state lines to make eastern and southern Oregon part of Idaho and also include a bit of northern California in there too. Now if you're saying that's ridiculous, consider this. Uh, because of the way our laws work, anyone can try and get anything on the ballot. They just need to have enough signatures. And this group, well, they didn't have quite enough signatures or really get anywhere close. But it was because of the pandemic they say that happened because it messed up all their efforts in gathering signatures. So they filed a lawsuit trying to get it on the ballot anyway. And yesterday, a judge... Well, the judge dismissed it, but it does bring us to our quote of the day from Oregon U.S. District Judge Michael McShane's ruling. Holding one rally, collecting less than 400 signatures, and hosting a Facebook page does not constitute reasonable diligence when compared with other initiative proponents. So basically he's saying, try harder or accept your fate. Good news is we don't need to buy new maps, so that's nice. But I should point out that same judge issued a very different ruling on another ballot measure earlier this month. It's an anti-gerrymandering proposal that would hand redistricting over to a nonpartisan group instead of having state lawmakers redraw those lines like they do now. And it would amend the Constitution so voters would have to vote on this and approve it. Now, like Greater Idaho people, uh, the Greater Idaho people, the group people, not politicians, they didn't get enough signatures to get it on the ballot either. They got a little closer, but they were still pretty far off, about 86,000 signatures short. This time around, though, the judge bought their argument that the pandemic prevented them from getting enough signatures. So he ordered the Secretary of State to either lower the signature threshold or automatically put the redistricting measure on the ballot. But that's not the end of it, because the Oregon Department of Justice is now appealing that ruling to the Ninth Circuit Court. See, Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum is not a fan of putting this on the ballot without enough signatures. In a statement, she says, whether a federal judge can rewrite the state constitution's procedures for constitutional amendments is a question that goes to the heart of the state's power to create its own laws. Any final decision made in this case could have long-reaching impacts for the state and on a future and on future ballot initiatives. So we're going to have to pay attention to this one, and of course, we will let you know what happens as it happens. But what officially are we going to see on the November ballot? What will we be voting on? See, statewide, only two initiative petitions got enough signatures. One of them we've been talking about a lot here on the story before, the Oregon Psilocybin Services Act, a.k.a. the Magic Mushroom Bill. If it passes, you could legally use magic mushrooms in the state, but only in a licensed therapeutic setting. See, unlike marijuana, you wouldn't be able to buy them in a store and take them home and use them there or anything like that, or even be able to grow them yourself. So this would be very heavily regulated. Supporters say that they can be used to treat things like anxiety and depression, and there are some studies that do back that up. Here's what a spokesperson from the campaign had to say. I've been involved with progressive drug policy reform for over 10 years here in Oregon, and I have met and worked with a lot of people who um, are suffering from mental health conditions. And I simply think there are more alternatives such as psilocybin therapy that Oregonians deserve access to. And so I really come at this from a healthcare perspective and being able to provide people more opportunities to explore things that might work for them better than what they're trying now. 
Now, here's the other initiative petition that got enough signatures for the statewide ballot. The Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act would decriminalize small amounts of drug possession. Then it would direct people to addiction treatment. Marijuana tax money would be used to pay for those services. The group emphasizes that the bill would not legalize any drugs. Rather, the goal is to get people out of the criminal justice system and into drug treatment programs. Okay, so that's the state ballot. What about the local stuff? Well, there's a lot, like a ton, and we cover a lot of different areas, but let's focus on, the interest, on an interesting one that sounds like it will be on the Multnomah County ballot. The Universal Preschool Now initiative would make preschool free for all three and four year olds in the county. Preschool teachers would also have a guaranteed $18 an hour, hour salary and have the right to unionize. This would all be funded by an income tax on the top 5% of our earners. And like most tax hike proposals, I'm betting it's going to get con kind of controversial. Again, there are a ton of ballot measures out there. We've got about three and a half months still until the election, so we're going to keep diving into all of these. But if you have questions about any of them, something that you want to know a little bit more about, please let us know with the hashtag HeyDan. When you have friends over for dinner, you're having a get-together. But when you go to church, you're part of a gathering. Why does this matter? Well, because in the eyes of Oregon law, in the time of COVID, a gathering and a get-together are very different things. We'll tell you how when the story continues. Well, honestly, I think that if the cops had never come out that first night and had just let people assemble and kind of say their piece, none of this would have gone on. I mean, a mother knows you don't let things escalate to this point. And I, I think it's completely unnecessary what they're doing. The, the grenades and the flash bombs and all that kind of thing. It seems like an angry Portland to me, but at the same time, what disturbs me is that the news is getting out that there's... I mean, I think people think this is a war zone, like every night there's fires and people are breaking windows and looting, and that's not what's going on here. There are people who are peacefully protesting, and the federal agents and the Portland police are instigating the violence. There, I mean, the video is going around today of the man who was simply standing there with his arms raised. The guy beat him with the baton a couple times. The other guy comes along, sprays him in the face with pepper spray. For what? We have a constitutional right to peacefully protest. That's what we're doing. It's our constitutional right. Hey, we're going to be hearing a lot more voices from last night's protest throughout the show. But we want to hear a lot of your voices as well. So keep talking to us. Uh, use that hashtag, HeyDan. Email us at the story at KGW.com. I love to read a couple of them at the end of the show. But we answer all of them, whether it's in uh, episodes down the line or I'll just write you back uh, in person and, and, and chat with you there. Of course, I did have yesterday off. Uh, you, you might have noticed that, which meant all of Maggie's fans were out in full force. David and Chris wrote in telling us, Maggie, it's great to see you. Keep up the great work. Courtney tweeted, we love you, Maggie. Thank you for filling in. And Michael Brody said, take another few days off, Dan. We really prefer your replacement. I have no shame in coming second place to Maggie Vespa. I, I am in second place, though, right? Don't answer that. Uh, of course, uh, we are getting some really serious messages, too. Lots, actually. Many still about Oregon's bans on social gatherings that are nearly a week old now, like why churches are allowed to have more people inside than your home. Kristen Severance looked into this, and it turns out it comes down to a simple difference between a gathering and a get-together. When it comes to Oregon's new rules, I think the confusing thing here is that the rules apply to social get-togethers one way and gatherings another way. So let's get into this. Let's start with an indoor social get-together. According to the Oregon Health Authority, that means a group of people getting together for social purposes. So that could be a dinner party, a birthday party, a book club, or a game night. Statewide, no matter what, no matter what county, no matter what phase that county is in, max capacity for indoor get together is 10 people. All right, so let's go into gathering now. A gathering as defined by the OHA is a group of individuals meeting for a common purpose indoors or outdoors. So for phase one counties, the maximum capacity for gatherings is 25 people indoor or outdoors. Now for phase two, it's 50 people indoors and it's 100 people outdoors. But, you know, we're still getting a lot of questions, a lot of Hey Dan questions from people about which venues and businesses really fall into which category. So let's answer a few more questions. This is a very common question. 
What about churches? All right, so churches must follow the rules outlined under gatherings. So the maximum capacity for gatherings, 25 people, indoor or outdoors. I asked the governor's office why churches were exempt from the 10-person rule, and they said in part, quote, through an email, it's important for people to express their faith in fellowship with others, whether that's online or in a setting that takes steps to keep people safe in ways that are based on guidance from health officials. Okay, next. Next question, what about weddings? So this is a little confusing because having a small wedding at your home is going to be different than having a wedding at a venue. So if you're getting married inside at home, you'd have to follow that 10 person limit. A wedding at a venue in phase one, that's a max of 25 people, including staff, and a wedding at a venue in phase two, that's a max 50 people indoors and outdoor can be up to 100 people. And lastly, you know, we've gotten some questions about indoor meetings, and this is an important one. A viewer wanted to know, are AA meetings exempt from the ruling of 10 people or less allowed to gather in an indoor social setting? Again, I brought this question directly to the governor's office who told me, quote, AA meetings are not social get-togethers and may continue. However, we would urge meeting organizers to practice that six feet of physical distance. Listen, there are a lot of questions about how each of this applies to each individual place, business, and group. If you have questions, we want to know. Let us know. Email us at the story at kgw.com or, of course, use everyone's favorite hashtag, hey Dan. We really will do our very best to get you answers. All right, Kristen, thank you. Hey, I know you got a lot of questions out there. Pick up the phone. As Kristen said, use that hashtag, hey Dan, to send them in. I know a lot of you aren't on Twitter. Email us too, the story at kgw.com. It's on your screen right now. It's a good time to reach out. I'm, I'm reading through them as we speak. Charlotte, I'm reading yours on Twitter using the hashtag, hey Dan. I'm going to address it as soon as we come back. Stick around. We'll finish the story next. I'm not a big fan of when protesters decide to um, initiate, um, you know, lighting some trash on fire, things like that, graffitiing walls, I'm not a big fan of that. But, you know, police violence in the light of graffiti is also, I mean, that's, that's far worse. Uh, we, we have much more of a threat in society from having the police become overly aggressive and controlling us, and we just have to obey at that point. We have no, we, you know, you no longer are able to live as a citizen free you just you live in fear of like, well, am I breaking a rule or something? Um, so I, I'm I, uh, right now. My big fear is not the protesters. It's not even the the more extreme edges of the protesters. My fear is the police, and more importantly, our federal government's police actions. Let's talk questions and comments. Earlier, I talked to Representative Janelle Bynum, who said that she believes that it's clear that the federal government is here to simply intimidate people and that everybody should know that. And it's very obvious. And I asked her, you know, what proof she has to kind of back up that stance. And uh, Charlotte A. Rotham O'Brien said, Hey, Dan, no evidence. What do you call the video of them beating, breaking bones, gassing? Uh, gassing peaceful people out there protesting. Um, so you're right, those are all pieces of evidence. I'm talking about proof to make such definitive comments is all, I'm, is all I'm saying. I'm not telling you who to believe or who not to believe. I'm only asking you to look for enough evidence to be able to make a definitive statement like that. Uh, you also, uh, Charlotte went on to say, unmarked, uh, unmarked armed men putting people in unmarked vans after handcuffing them. The uh, federal agents went on today and explained that the reason that they said that the vans were unmarked is because people were targeting marked vehicles. If they had the insignia of law enforcement on it, they became a target. That they didn't go into the crowd to arrest people because that would be dangerous. They identified them and went and got them later. And while their equipment was marked, they don't have their names labeled because people, they said they cited about 38 people being doxxed within the law enforcement community. So these are all things that we are going to check up on. We are going to continue researching, but I want you to assess all of the information we have before making really strong and definitive statements about protesters or about the police or about any of that. We really need to make that, make that clear and important. John, I want to get to you. He said, you don't respond to all the messages. Don't say you do. I've written three times. No response. Fact. John. I'm sorry, John. Write us back. Four, I'm giving you, I'm going to, Right now, I'm, I'm heading off set. I'll talk to you, John.